So let's get started. I'm Mary Davis Fournier, Deputy Director of the ALA Public Programs Office and Project Director for Libraries Transforming Communities. And we are very excited to share with you this free learning series that will explore various dialogue facilitation approaches and support library professionals being able to position themselves to foster conversation and lead change in their communities. The relevance and importance of this work in our world today speaks for itself, but perhaps ALA President Julie Todaro put it best recently when she said that as our nation becomes increasingly divided, ALA sees tremendous opportunity for libraries to be a leading force for reconciliation, progress, and common ground. So let's hold that thought today. And with that purpose in mind, I'd like to introduce my two co-presenters. Cindy Fessmeyer, Director of the Columbus Public Library in Columbus, Wisconsin. Librarianship is Cindy Fessmeyer's second career, following 14 years in nonprofit administration and community organizing. From 2013 to 2015, Cindy led a team, of, team comprised of staff and community members as part of the Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative. She's also contributed to the Aspen Institute Action Guide for Public Libraries project and is a member of the 2017 PLA Leadership Academy cohort. Today, she'll share some of her experiences and provide some insight for those of you who are newer to this work of library-led community action, discussion, and change. And I'm so happy to also introduce Courtney Breeze, Managing Director of the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. We are so happy to have her and NCDD as our partner in this initiative. In addition to directing NCDD's ongoing programming, its many projects, and its biennial national conferences, she is a trained dialogue and deliberation facilitator, trainer, and mediator. With extensive experience in the National Issues Forums framework, Courtney has also worked with the Massachusetts Office of Public Collaboration, training and managing mediation programs. Models for Change is a two-year professional development project that gives library workers access to free training and community leadership techniques such as coalition building and dialogue facilitation. Now, what does that mean? It means it's about listening and bringing people together to build better communities, more effective libraries, and to enact change. And this introductory webinar will provide an overview of this new initiative. By the end of the webinar, we hope that you will have learned about this initiative and about ALA's project partners for learning and how to register for upcoming trainings. And we also hope that you've gained a clear picture of why these tools and trainings will be able to help you and your libraries to better engage with specific communities. Briefly, here's our agenda. We've done inter introductions. We're in the middle of uh, the sort of ALA overview. Cindy Fessmeyer will share her experiences with us. Courtney Breeze will explain a bit more about what the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation is and does and their resources, and she'll also give us an overview of the models that will be taught as part of this initiative. We'll have some FAQs and point you to more resources, and then we will have time for questions and answers at the end. First, a little overview. The crux of the LTC initiative is that if libraries have the community engagement tools they need to bring disparate voices together and lead change, then we will have stronger communities. So right now, you're going to see a polling box to the right that we mentioned before asking the question, have you ever used libraries transforming communities resources? We're wondering if you have any experience or familiarity with the resources in this initiative for the past couple of years. They are not necessary to participate in this, but we're just getting a baseline for the people in the room today so that we can better serve you. Remember, when you're done answering the poll, just expand your chat and the Q&A window back, 
and then at the end of the webinar, we'll be able to see the results, learn a little bit about each other, and also share some other resources that may help you as you tackle this work, no matter where you are in your learning. But one context piece I'd like to give. For the past couple of years, ALA has worked with the Harvard Institute to develop an array of resources, including webinars and tools for learning the Turning Outward Framework, which boils down to a shift away from your institution and toward the community. And ALA continues to support these tools, and although familiarity with Turning Outward is not necessary for participation in the Models for Change learning series, we do recommend that everyone check them out at ala.org forward slash LTC. And what we did learn over the past few years of this is that when libraries turn outward toward their communities, there is a positive shift in the way libraries are perceived and the way we work with our partners and the way we work with community needs. The basic deliverables for this initiative involve training for public and academic libraries specifically, involve continuing to foster community of practice for this work, involve ALA's commitment to gathering and sharing your stories of practice and to communicate about them to the field and beyond, and then we'll talk toward the end of the webinar about specific help in the form of funds that we're offering to rural libraries. This slide represents the sustainability model for this work. We are providing resources in the form of tools, webinars, in-person training, and other resources targeted at academic and public libraries in the hope of fostering sustainability, not just in the form of ongoing work in communities and the services that are influenced by that work, but also in a cross-sector community of practice. Here is how this will all play out. Starting with today, where you're in the first module here, attending an overview webinar. We will then go on to offer free web-based and in-person workshops that are specifically designed for three library types. The first one, launching this spring, next month, serving, is serving public libraries who are serving larger and urban communities. That will run through the spring of 2017. There will be an in-person training in conjunction with the ALA Annual Conference in June. That training will be a chance, and all of these in-person trainings will be a chance to take one of the more in-depth models that we are teaching via webinar and try it out and delve a little deeper into that learning. In the fall of 2017, academic libraries will enjoy the series that we have put together with two other models, also culminating in an in-person workshop in February of 2018 in conjunction with the ALA Midwinter Meeting in Denver, Colorado. And then in this winter and spring of 2018, our third module is targeted toward smaller, mid-sized, and rural communities and it will culminate in an in-person workshop taking place in conjunction with the 2018 ALA Annual Conference in June. ALA and the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation have worked to identify two models for each of these learning streams, and Courtney Breeze from NCDD will get into these models in a little bit, but know that each of these webinars has been designed to give you the tools you need to try them with your community. Our hope is that practitioners in both sectors, public and academic, can see themselves in those areas. But what if you feel like you fall in between those categories? No worries. Listen to what Courtney has to say and sign up for what feels like applies best to your situation or your aspirations for this work. We list here the AIMLS designations for library size and type, and that's what we use to create these learning streams. But understand, it is how you see yourself and your library. So if your community is like mine, and it's 50,000 people bordering a city of many millions, and you feel that the first series may serve your needs more, 
then sign up for that one. Just sign up. Again, all of these sessions are free, and the webinars will be freely downloadable for further self-directed learning. And with that, I'd like to pause and invite Cindy Fessmeyer to share a bit of her experience with this work of library-led community engagement and dialogue facilitation in her community of Columbus, Wisconsin. Thanks so much, Mary, and hey, everybody. Um, this slide shows you what I look like, but it also shows you what my little library in Columbus, uh, Wisconsin looks like. And the reason you're seeing um, kind of tradition and innovation up there is that um, we are a library that, according to Mary's previous slide, we're somewhere between very small and small. So we serve a municipality of 5,000 people and another 10,000 people in the more rural areas around us. Uh, because we are uh, historically manufacturing and agricultural communities, we have very deep traditional roots. Many families have lived in Columbus for a very long time. On the other hand, we're only about a half hour from Madison, which has a, a large university and is the seat of state government. So we're rapidly becoming a bedroom community. So those are two different kinds of um, forces within the community that we uh, strive to work with each and every day in Columbus. So before I get started, um, and really what I'll be doing is that sharing my story part that Mary talked about earlier. Before I go there, let me tell you why the library. Now some of you might have heard this and some of you might know this cold, but why should the library get involved in transforming our communities? Um, I know for me, when I've been doing this in my community, some people ask, you're a librarian, why are you doing this? Really good question. Truthfully, the kind of snippy answer is, if not us, then who is going to do it? Who in our community is doing it? Who has this infinite trust that libraries have from the citizens within the communities they serve? And so why shouldn't it be us is kind of my answer to you. We know our communities. We know the people within our communities. We know what they want for themselves and for their families. We know their aspirations. We know their challenges in life. I would say that libraries are actually perfectly seated to be the ones to help foster change within their communities. Why is it worth it for the, for the library to do that? Doing this kind of change will probably not immediately up your SERPs or uh, the number of people walking through your door. Um, we're, we're all working on, on those issues, but I will say that what a library can do is more than just circ a material to somebody, we can help foster meaningful change within our communities. Together, hand in hand with other community organizations, with the municipalities we serve, and with the citizens within the community, we can have a significant impact for the people who live in these communities. And the other thing that I think is really important, especially in this day and age, is what it does is gives libraries the opportunity to really just stay relevant, man. We need to stay at the forefront of people's minds when it comes to their thoughts about the awesome things within their community. So this really helps us step up and say, hey, we're here, don't forget about us. We're changing right along with you. Um, keep an eye on what's coming next from us. The last thing I'll say about that uh, was mentioned a little bit by Mary a few moments ago, and that is that engagement with our community is true democracy. This has nothing to do with the politics of the day, the kind of White House politics. This has to do with um, actual democracy by, of, and for the people. And if anyone within a, a community could be by, of, and for the people, that's us folks. So be ready to just kind of stake your claim and say, yeah, we're in it with everybody. Okay, so enough preaching from me. Um, what I want to do is tell you quickly my story. So as Mary mentioned, I've been doing this work for a number of years and was fortunate enough to be in the Libraries Transforming Communities cohort uh, some years back. And as part of an effort to connect with our community and find out what they want for themselves, we held, among many other ways of collecting uh, opinions from people, we held a series of community conversations. In my municipality, we held 12 of these, communi these community conversations, and that involved uh, about 140 people over those 12. This photo on here is my favorite one. This is looking into a vacant storefront, and our small downtown is full of vacant storefronts. We're seeing um, no 
growth in the middle of town and lots of growth on the outskirts, which I'm sure many of you are seeing in your municipalities as well. So for one night, we turned on the lights and we occupied a vacant storefront and invited uh, local business members, Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Inc. people to come together and talk about their aspirations for their community. No surprise, they talked a lot about business. Uh, other organizations, other individuals that we spoke with, they talked about whatever was on their mind. Another way that we collected information from people that was a little more uh, quantitative was this version on a wish tree. We turned it into a route for Columbus tree, and uh, the tree traveled around town uh, for about two months. It was in coffee shops, uh, gas stations, the library, schools, the hospital. Um, every couple weeks we moved it, and we wanted the answer to one question. What kind of community do you want? And so we got, I think, about 450 leaves on our tree, and that gave us the ability to actually um, quantitatively take a look at our data. The community conversation uh, is much more qualitative, a little more mushy. This gave us the ability to put some numbers and percentages to the things that people wanted. So um, these two things, along with many other ways that you can read about in those materials that Mary mentioned, um, are just some of the ways that you can talk to your community and get the pulse of the community and help find out what it wants, what are its aspirations. So what we learned in Columbus is that people want a vibrant and welcoming community for all. So that's pretty bland, right? Everybody wants a vibrant and welcoming community for all. What we were able to do, though, was dial in and get some of those details. So truly, I mentioned on my first slide that we have a, a tension between the more traditional population and the more innovative population. Um, and, and not surprisingly, we heard from a lot of people that they're concerned that folks aren't working together. They're letting their differences keep them apart. As we talked to people about those concerns, they told us about the lack of opportunities to kind of cross social borders of uh, religion, politics, uh, the, the language that you speak, um, your income, and that they wanted uh, more ways to cross those boundaries. We also heard about the lack of just general stuff for kiddos and families to do within town. So citizens told us that they needed to focus on bringing people together to create civic pride. And if the citizens themselves played a part in these actions, folks would be more likely to trust the effort and step forward. So this really was important to us. We heard people say that they want to be working together, that they were willing to come together, and that they were willing to help lead that change. So we were really excited about that. Um, this is a, a big pie-in-the-sky thing to reach for. Before we got there, we did a little bit of small stuff around that um, lack of stuff for kids and families to do, and we immediately started after school clubs and tailoring uh, our library's offerings to the wants of the families within our community, and now we have a once a week after school club. On that bigger topic of busting down social barriers, we launched a thing we called the Root for Columbus Action Potluck. At this highly facilitated um, two-hour meeting, we spent a full half hour sharing food together, just chatting, and um, I hope you all know the power of eating together and feeding each other. It's really powerful, especially in Columbus, and um, I, I really uh, encourage you to involve food if you can. It breaks down barriers by itself because everyone has to eat. The remaining 90 minutes, however, we used in a big group um, blue sky brainstorms and then dialed it down to thematic small projects that the community could do between this, pot this potluck and the next one, three or four months down the road. So very small, bite-sized, actionable, but highly visible projects come out of these potlucks uh, three to four times per year. And when you go into the Columbus, you can see these projects alive right in front of you. So what does that mean, though, for the library, and really why, why should you get involved? This is a new way for libraries to interact with their, their communities that they serve. Well, I'll tell you, looking forward for, for um, my municipality, for the city of Columbus and the area around it, we're already seeing some change. Uh, remember that photo I showed you of the community conversation of the Chamber of Commerce and business groups? Well, traditionally, many of them do not get along well at all. We were able to bring them to the table for this one night, but I'm really happy to report to you that about a year and a half later, when we've learned the main street that almost all of them are located on 
it's going to be uh, torn up for construction this whole summer coming up, the library was able to convene people around um, this challenge for the business community and people are coming together regardless of kind of those old feelings they may have had. So we're seeing some, some good feelings come out of the original community conversation. We're also seeing citizen-led things happen, like truly just this morning I saw that somebody in Columbus, I don't know who, launched a new Facebook um, group called Progressives for, uh, for Columbus. And this is new, uh, social media kind of networking hadn't been happening within Columbus. So that's kind of breaking news for us. But then we've also got other community groups like our local historical society coming and wanting to partner with us and, and wanting to become a program of us. And that feels really good for us. So in addition for the library itself, I think it's really given us, the library, a seat at the table amongst community leaders. And by that I mean folks who work in City Hall, elected leaders and um, kind of the, the bigger muckety-mucks within the town. Uh, I think that there's a new respect for what we're able to do. We can bring people together and have them converse um, congenially. When we're doing that, we're really elevating my position within the community. More importantly, we're elevating the library's position and other staff who people interact with all the time. We're also given the opportunity to elevate local grassroots leaders. Me, personally, my road ahead, I'm very grateful to be among the early adopters and I am passionate about making the work of the community the work of the library. Um, we would be nothing without the community, so we want to reflect what they want for themselves. I would say at this point I have more to offer our profession as a whole and hopefully that expands my career options down the road, fingers crossed, but overall I just love the fact that I can marry my passion for social justice and and being part of a local grassroots effort with the fabulous institutions of public libraries. And now I'd like to turn it over to my presenter, Courtney Breeze. She is the Managing Director of the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. She will introduce to us, introduce us to NCDD and we'll get into the content of the dialogue and del deliberation models that are part of this learning series. Thanks, take it away, Courtney. Wonderful, thank you, Cindy. All right. So as libraries, you are tapped into the community and you can see issues, interests, service needs, and so on. And for some of you, your skills have been bolstered by the turning outward approach featured in the first Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative with the Harvard Institute, just like Cindy has described for us just now. So before I get into my presentation, I want to um, talk with you for a few minutes about your community's needs. So consider the following question for a moment. What is an issue you see your community grappling with or a topic that is ripe for engagement? So take a moment to think about that and please feel free to share um, the issues or topics that come to mind for you in the chat. Uh, and the first one, not surprisingly, that pops up is the election. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I think that's, that's an issue ripe for conversation in all of our communities across the country right now. Excellent. I am not surprised, but very excited to see all of these ideas popping up here. And I'm just gonna highlight some of them for you all um, because there's 400 of you with us, so no chance we can touch on all of them at this point. But I see um, issues like immigration popping up, affordable housing, um, education, education's popping up quite a bit, um, issues with opiate abuse, um, my goodness. And then other topics like mindfulness, climate change. Just taking some more looks here. Uh, someone mentioned the Brock Turner trial. So perhaps sexual assault be a part of these conversations. Empathy building, fabulous. Topics like diversity. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so clearly you have, you're quite attuned to the needs of your communities and have lots of ideas for conversations that need to happen in your communities. Um, and I would say that many of these topics that you're listing here right now 
are things that are perfect for dialogue and really prime for, um, for good engagement processes. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing all of those with us. Um, and I'll try to pull from these some more as, as I go along in my <clears throat> presentation today. Um, a couple things I'll just point out. Obviously, we see a variety of responses here. Some are some pretty divisive, um, tough topics uh, to tackle, things like integration, um, even healthcare these days has become a divisive issue. Um, and so on. Uh, and depending on how exactly you want to engage the community, whether it's um, you're looking to explore just where people stand on the issues and explore and get a better understanding of differing perspectives, um, or whether you're really trying to come to some kind of decision on things, like perhaps education matters. Um, you need to have a community conversation about your own education system in your town or city. Um, how you approach those is going to differ. And so I'll talk a little bit more about some of the approaches that we're uh, highlighting in this project um, that will help you to address different kinds of issues like these. So as I said, um, it is clear that you're attuned to the needs of communities that you serve, uh, but perhaps some additional skills in convening, facilitating, or partnering could be helpful to libraries in your desire to be active sites and partners in community engagement. So it's that thinking that got us to where we are today with ALA partnering with the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. And to be clear, we talk about community engage engagement a lot in regards to this program. So what exactly do we mean by that? For NCDD, it is engaging a community in a different, thoughtful kind of conversation about something important or pressing for them. This is a complement to the library's turning outward projects of the past couple years which sought to help libraries ask the right questions of what their communities want. And you just saw an example of that um, that Cindy gave you. As part of Models for Change, we're bringing tools and strategies to you for being able to help your communities engage on topics and issues that matter to them so that you can be better equipped to help your communities get to the transformations, decisions, and action plans that they need. And I see a question about national coalition of what, and that is exactly what I'm going to talk about right now. All right, so the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, we have it up on your screen there. So who the heck are we? Um, NCDD, as we like to go by, because that's much easier to remember than National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, plus that's a mouthful. Uh, we are a network of over 2,300 individuals and organizations all innovators who bring people together across divides to tackle today's toughest challenges. So NCDD, the organization, serves as a gathering place, a resource clearinghouse, a news source, and a facilitative leader for this extraordinary community. So NCDD's membership in the U.S. is visible on your screen now. This is a little screenshot of our map which you can also view and engage with at ncdd.org slash map. And that was just added into the chat for you if you want to grab that. Um, as you'll see at the bottom of the image, membership is categorized into different groups, including government, higher education, consultants and facilitators, and other members. Among our 2,300 members, we have organizations and individuals and these and other roles who are experienced in bringing people together across divides. And they are located in just about, if not every state in the U.S. Some of you may be connected to these folks already. A good number of them have experience working with libraries. Those of you who haven't connected with them will have more opportunities to do so through this project. We will be making efforts to partner libraries with NCDD members to offer additional guidance, facilitation, training, or other services as you embark on your efforts. So, as it says in our name, our network is categorized as focusing on dialogue and deliberation. What exactly do we mean when we use these terms? To illustrate that, I've shared this chart from Sandy Hodge and Patty Deneen, which shows the differences between debate, which I think we're all very familiar with, particularly after our recent election season, uh, as well as dialogue and deliberation. As you'll see, unlike debate, which is very competitive and argumentative, Dialogue is an exchange of ideas or opinions characterized by participants sharing information, experiences, and honest perspectives face-to-face, -face, 
with the goal of seeking greater understanding among participants and sometimes, but not always, a decision or an action. The goal of dialogue is to deepen understanding and judgment and to think about ways to make a difference on an issue. This is more likely to occur in a safe, focused discussion when people exchange views freely and consider a variety of views. Deliberation, like dialogue, is also about an exchange of ideas, but it goes a step further in seeking to make choices about a difficult decision. At the heart of deliberation is weighing possible actions and decisions carefully by examining their benefits, costs, and consequences in light of what is most valuable to each of us. Dialogue and deliberation are dynamic processes, which can be relationship changing, conflict resolving, action planning, community building, consciousness raising, and more. The various models and methods that are used in our field often emphasize, strive for, and obtain different outcomes. That is why, in designing the Models for Change project, NCBD selected a variety of partners and methodologies to feature and introduce to libraries. So there are different goals in community engagements and therefore different approaches to take and how to conduct the engagement. In order to help people navigate the range of choices, uh, of dialogue and deliberation approaches rather, available and make design choices that best fit their circumstances and resources, NCBD works with our network to develop the engagement streams framework. And that's represented by the four streams in this graphic in front of you right now. Engagement streams categorizes dialogue and deliberation approaches into four streams based on one's primary intention or purpose and shows which of the most well-known methods have proven themselves especially effective in each stream. So the purpose of each of the four streams of engagement is listed on this slide, and I'm gonna talk about each of them briefly. Exploration is about encouraging community members to learn more about themselves their community or an issue. This is helpful when a community needs to reflect and gain collective insights or make new connections to one another, but not necessarily to make a decision. Conflict transformation processes create safe spaces for resolving conflicts, building trust, and improving relations in a community. It can be used when healing is needed after a crisis or trauma, for instance. Decision-making approaches are used to involve a community in influencing or making decisions about policy or other issues. They are about deliberating, examining options, and coming to a decision or a direction for the community or a governing body in charge to implement. And finally, collaborative action empowers communities to solve problems, take collective responsibility for action. It is often a good approach to take when multiple entities or stakeholders are involved or need to be a part of a solution. So NCBD, in developing the plans for this project, identified methodologies in all four engagement streams to introduce libraries to. These methodologies provide a range of dialogue approaches for different settings, group sizes, resources, and purposes. If you'd like to dig deeper, we've just shared a link in the chat to a more in-depth version of the engagement streams framework now. This gives you more information on each of the streams as well as the models we'll be introducing through this project. It's a streamlined engagement streams uh, document, if you will, um, that will focus on just the six models that we are presenting to you as part of the Models for Change project. So I'm going to briefly describe these six models that we'll be teaching in this series. As I talk about each of them, think about different roles that libraries can play in bringing these processes to their communities. You as librarians could be a facilitator of a dialogue, but you could also serve as a convener, a host, or another role with other community partners. Also think about how these tools can be used by the library itself for internal dialogues as well as for community engagement. They do have multiple purposes. All right. So Conversation Cafe. Conversation Cafe is an exploratory type of dialogue. People gather together in small groups for 60 to 90 minutes for a dialogue that gives people a chance to feel heard, process their feelings, or explore a topic. And there's a link to Conversation Cafe's website in your chat now. We chose this approach for the smaller rural library series as it's simple, easy to organize, requires minimal resources, 
and has great flexibility in regards to topics, but it can be used in any library, of course. Several libraries, including the Austin Public Library and the Great Neck Library in New York, offer monthly conversation cafes in the library to allow community members to explore different topics together as part of the regular programming. So imagine for a moment, bringing people together to, to discuss current issues such as immigration, we heard that come up several times in the chat just a couple minutes ago, the presidential election, also a hot topic right now, or some more philosophical topics such as freedom or death, and yes, people will come together to talk about death. People are invited to, into a small circle of chairs and invited one by one to go around the circle and speak to what is on their mind with regards to the topic without interruption or comment from other participants. Then an open dialogue begins. No actions necessarily come from the dialogue, but people leave the cafe with a better sense of one another, deeper understandings of their own and of others' perspectives. And as you can see here in the images, these are a couple examples of uh, conversation cafes. Um, some folks have had them around their dinner tables, um, but most of the time they've happened in cafes, libraries, and other settings um, where people are just seated in those, those comfy little circles and able to talk to one another. All right, so next is World Cafe. So World Cafe also falls into the exploratory stream. World Cafe allows people to dialogue with one another in three or more evolving rounds of small groups, while also being part of a single collective conversation between all participating. and markers to allow the group to track their thoughts in each round. Uh, and we've added a link to World Cafe in the chat as well. An example of World Cafe in action comes from actually a librarian, Audrey Barbakoff of the Kitsap Regional Library in Washington State. We just recently spoke with Audrey and she told us about how she led a local World Cafe about the immigrant experience. During the cafe, they posed questions to the small groups that built upon one another. They were first asked to talk about what the immigrant experience was for their families. Then they were asked to reflect on what it might look and feel like for an immigrant coming into their community today. At one point, everyone started writing down all the countries that their families came from. Audrey reported to us that it was powerful to expose that diversity in the room. The goal of the cafe was not to come to a decision, but to explore immigrant experience and consider how it applies to their community. She noted the value of using this method for listening, empathy, and increasing understanding among participants. It can also be used for boosting creativity and exploring ideas together. World Cafe offers the larger library set an opportunity to engage a large portion of the community in a single event, and that's why we've selected it for the larger public library series, but it can just as easily be applied to smaller groups as well. And Samantha, perhaps we can reshare that World Cafe link one more time. Thank you. All right, so our next process is reflective structured dialogue, which is a method from essential partners. And that's our selected conflict transformation process for this project. And we've got the link for essential partners in your chat right now. This process draws on strategies from therapists, mediators, organizational development, and more, and is a relationship-centered approach. Essential partners approach was most notably used for dialogues between pro-choice and pro-life leaders in Boston when the organization was then known as Public Conversations Project. These dialogues followed the murder of two women outside local abortion clinics in 1994. Participants on both sides of the debate came together in dialogue four times over the following year. The goals of their dialogue were to communicate, build relationships, de-escalate the rhetoric of the abortion controversy, and reduce the risk of future shootings. Participants found dignity and goodness in the people representing the other side of the issue and increase their compassion and civility towards one another. The group actually continued these first meetings into a series of conversations that ultimately lasted seven years. 
This dialogue structure is usually best utilized as a sustained dialogue over time. So that doesn't necessarily mean seven years in all cases. Participants come together multiple times to share experiences and explore questions that both clarify their own perspectives and help them become more comfortable around and curious about those with whom they're in conflict. We selected this approach for the academic libraries as it can be well suited to addressing issues in a campus community, as well as helping deeply explore diverse perspectives on an issue. But certainly I imagine many of you in public libraries will see application as well. All right, national issues forums method is the decision-making approach selected for this project. The link to National Issues Forum uh, Institute is in your chat right now. National Issues Forums challenge participants to examine potential approaches to a complex issue by weighing the benefits, drawbacks, and potential trade-offs to each approach. Participants gather in a circle of up to 25 or so, or in multiple smaller groups, to deliberate on the options presented and determine what they are willing to live with in order to get what they want. The outcome is common ground for action, meaning participants identify shared common ground that can lead to decisions and action. We selected this for the academic library series as it can be used for both academic programming and community-focused dialogues. National Issues Forums even has historical framings now, asking participants to put themselves in the shoes of those who made important decisions in history. Nothing better than going back in time and imagining what decision you would make if you had been the decision maker at that time. So National Issues Forums may be familiar to you all. They have a long track record working with libraries. An academic library-based example actually comes from Rutgers University, and I believe Nancy Cronick, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. A team of librarians named and framed a discussion entitled, What is the Future Role for Library Liaisons at Rutgers University? which provided choices about the evolution of new roles and institutional strategies for strengthening relationships within the university community. A deliberative dialogue about new approaches to working with the Rutgers community provided library staff an opportunity to talk together about possibilities for engaging more directly with the campus in library services, instruction, and scholarly communication. Roles were redefined and strategies for action reconsidered. Subsequently, Rutgers University librarians launched a series of conversations to recalibrate their interactions with the campus community. These conversations focused on aspirations, are bringing people with common concerns together, unleashing new possibilities to occupy a more visible, value, valued role on campus and build partnerships. One of the two collaborative action approaches featured in this project is Everyday Democracy's Dialogue to Change approach. This approach aims for inclusive community change and action planning and draws on community organizing approaches. Diverse groups of community members come together in small groups over several sessions to build understanding, explore solutions, and catalyze change. The link to Everyday Democracy's website is in your chat now. A great example of a library using everyday democracy's approach comes from Hartford, Connecticut. There's actually a great case study on the library's transforming community site about how they have used the turning outward approach and worked with everyday democracy to address trust issues in the north end of town between residents and institutions. So following a turning outward process to reveal the needs of the north end community in Hartford, the library set up a series of deeper dive discussions in the North End around police community relationships and public safety. And there's a link to the case study in your chat now if you want to dig deeper into that. Police lieutenants were part of the conversation and the larger group ultimately broke into three smaller groups focused on specific themes that emerged. For these three action team conversations, the team used the engagement tools provided by Everyday Democracy. The three action teams focused on the following. One focused on the media. Residents felt mainstream news media portrayed life in their neighborhood as worse than it really was. So they worked with the media to find ways to share additional stories from the community. Joint learning experiences for the community and police. 
This group came up with ideas, including working with a local community theater group. And finally, youth and teenagers' relationship with police. The group is working on a community event with the police department and hopes to organize a fun event for youth and families that also explains how the police department is organized and how decisions are made. And last, but certainly not least, our final method is the collaborative action approach future search. Future search is a planning method that enables communities to identify a mission, take responsibility for action, and develop commitment to implementation. It's particularly useful in fast-changing situations where everyone needs to have the same big picture in order to act. Because all sectors are involved, it builds strong ownership and powerful shared experiences. The link to Future Search is in your chat now. Future Search can be used in the community as well as by libraries internally. For example, in 2008, a Nebraska Libraries Future Search event was held to bring a fresh perspective to Nebraska library service needs and foster direction, partnerships, and collaboration. The goals of this future search event included developing a shared vision for library and information services in Nebraska, designing a blueprint for seamless, customer-centered, life-centered, lifelong access to library and information service, engaging librarians from all types and sizes of libraries to unite and speak with one voice, and fostering collaboration among library and information per information professional organizations, library advocates, and library resources in order to improve library and information services for Nebraskans. They met over two days to discuss, brainstorm, identify approaches, and make decisions for how libraries across the state could work together. A task force was formed as a follow-up to the conference, and libra librarians across the state left with next steps to address the needs identified and achieve the goals that were stated. So this method could help libraries in smaller communities serve as a facilitative leader for their community where plans need to be developed with the input of a variety of stakeholders. And that's why we've selected it for the Small and Rural Library Series. It can also be a helpful tool to libraries in their own planning processes. All right. So let's go back to our conversation earlier in the session where we talked about issues or topics right for engagement in your communities. And let's start to think about next steps that you can take in the time between today and participating in the training sessions. What can you do as a next step to get the ball rolling? For instance, what entities or organizations might you talk to? And how can you learn more from your community about what most needs to be discussed? Now, I'm not expecting you to have answers to these right this moment. I'm just posing these as things to ask yourself between now and when you start to get these trainings. I suggest talking with your peers, potential partners in your communities, and taking note of what you might like to do and who would need to be involved in order to do that. So what community organizations might you need to bring to the table? Are there government entities that need to be involved? And so on. Take a look also at the engagement stream and think about what types of engagement you may be best suited for or may be most useful to your community. Getting a better sense of this will assist you in considering the method that will best suit your needs before the training gets underway. Think too about how to learn about your community's needs if you find yourself unsure of what topic is most ripe for engagement. So think back to Cindy's remarks, for instance, for some creative ideas of how to seek that feedback from your community. Hold those community conversations, ask them about what they'd like to see for their community. Maybe use the tree idea. Personally, I think that's a fabulous way to, to gather that information. And don't feel like you have to take on the biggest issue or challenge in your community right off the bat. Start with something manageable, of importance to your community, but perhaps not as divisive, complex, or difficult to facilitate unless you feel like you're ready to do that. Understand that for many of you, you are just getting started and it'll take time to learn and grow your efforts. And know that in the meantime, our network will be available to help when you need us. So now that we've talked about the methods that we're featuring and your next steps in planning for your engagement efforts, I'm going to show you the timeline for the webinar and training sessions. So what we've got up here 
right now is the um, series for large and urban communities. We start, we're starting those next month, as Mary alluded to earlier in her presentation. Our first webinar is March 9th. That'll be an introductory session. Um, myself and our founding director of NCDD, Sandy Heyerbacher, will be presenting that session, where we'll dig a little bit deeper into dialogue and deliberation and give you some introduction to the two processes that we'll be featuring, World Cafe and Everyday Democracy. And as you can see here, each of those um, processes will provide a webinar session um, in April and in May. And this series will culminate in the in-person workshop at the ALA Annual Conference in June. And I believe we just shared a link for more information on this, so you can, you can grab all those dates and everything from, from the website. Our second series starts in the fall of 2017. That is the Academic Library Series. We start again with an introductory webinar in September, followed by sessions featuring National Issues Forums and Essential Partners in October and November. And again, that culminates in a in-person workshop session at the ALA Midwinter in February 2018. And then finally, last but certainly not least, our third series is in winter and spring of 2018. That'll be for the mid-sized, small, or rural communities. We'll start with the sessions in February, March, and April, and culminating with the in-person workshop in June 2018 at the ALA Annual Conference. All right, so I'm gonna hand the presentation tool back over to Mary. And we're gonna go through some frequently asked questions. Thank you so much, uh, Courtney and Cindy. That was terrific and a lot of information. Uh, but based on the number of people here today and the responses um, to uh, the questions, um, that Courtney tossed out in the chat box, I'd say that there is um, tremendous appetite for this work. Um, so before we begin the open question and answers uh, period of our agenda, I'm just gonna go over a few additional details and answers to some frequent questions we've already been hearing. Um, so one is, is experience or prior knowledge of community or civic engagement necessary to participate in any of these learning sessions? And the answer is no. Um, but remember, this is self-directed learning. So to participate, uh, you know, what we recommend, no matter what size of library you represent, we encourage you to recruit a peer to be your buddy in this work. Remember, because it's largely self-directed, having someone to talk about these tools with and try them out uh, will be very helpful. And um, in order to participate in the in-person trainings, if you are able to do that, you must have completed the three web webinars and any related readings that lead up to it. Um, we've been asked if we'll be offering CEUs for these trainings, and although we're unable to offer LA CEUs, we will provide you with a certificate of attendance if requested, and we are partnering with the Center for the Future of Libraries to offer badging through Credly. Uh, the Models for Change work falls under the leadership training in Credly's, in the ALA Credly Matrix, and each of the webinars will earn attendees a pink leadership badge. The slide you see right now simply shows some of the other badges that ALA divisions participating in the Credly badging offer. A completion of the online series and the in-person training will earn you a cumulative badge, and these badges can be added to your LinkedIn profile and other digital professional summaries. If your library is interested in displaying these badges in staff web profiles, we will work with you to make that happen for your library website. And is, is there a cost? No, it's free. Uh, thanks to the generous support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, it is free. Um, all webinars and the in-person workshops are free. And um, I, in addition, I'll talk about some funds that are available for small rural libraries in just a moment. And first, a few notes. Um, so 
based on the high interest we've seen in registrations for the first round of webinars, we feel that the in-person trainings are going to fill up quickly. We have space for 50 people at each of these in-person uh, pre-conference workshops. They are day-long workshops. And for the first one in June 2017, a preference will be given to the public library workers serving larger, mid to larger urban communities. We are working with um, ALA's conference services to set up a waiting list that will be activated after those first 50 libraries are filled, library slots, uh, sorry, are filled. And remember, in order to attend those in-person trainings, you must have completed the three webinars. Uh, the second series is geared toward academic librarians. Preference will be given to academic library professionals um, and academic library workers, I should say, for that pre-conference. And there is also going to be a waiting list, and we also require uh, completion of the three related webinars. And for the final workshop, uh, preference, again, will be given to library workers from medium to small and rural libraries. And although um, each of these learning opportunities are free of charge, and the live webinars will be recorded and available. We do realize that travel to the in-person workshop will be challenging for many, uh, especially for librarians from very small rural libraries. And with that in mind, we are able to offer 25 stipends of $800 each to help rural librarians travel to the final in-person training workshop in June of 2018. In December of 2017, we will open the opportunity to apply for the travel stipend. And there will also undoubtedly be a waiting list for that in-person workshop. And yes, you must complete all three of the related uh, webinars in order to participate. We've also been asked um, if all the webinars will be recorded, and yes, all the Models for Change webinars will be recorded and available via the project website, ala.org slash LTC, within one week of the live webinar. And we are unable at this time um, to record the in-person training. And before uh, we... Um, talk a bit about questions and uh, some resources. Uh, it'd be great if we could look at our poll. Okay, um, and so everyone should probably see the poll results under, for the questions under, have you ever lose, used libraries transforming communities resources? So by a significant margin, I'd say the people who responded to the poll are not familiar with those. So that is to say, that that is not necessary uh, to participate in this initiative at all. However, I do want to direct you to the links that you see on this screen to our Libraries Transforming Communities resources from the past couple of years. Um, if you want to get started on this work before you're able to, before a webinar is here, before you're able to find an opportunity that you feel suits your needs, dig into that website. There are many um, webinars that are available and recorded there that specifically get into the turning outward approach uh, started by the Harwood Institute. There are tools. Um, I saw some questions go through in chat in terms of what conditions are necessary to pursue this work in your community. There is um, there are tools specifically uh, designed for sort of gauging where your community is at and um, sort of to help you get an overall framework together and this work. Um, there is also a listserv opportunity. Um, people are already making connections, I've seen in the chat going back and forth, and already creating uh, that community of practice with the almost 400 people who have been on this webinar. But there is also an opportunity to sign up directly for what is an old-fashioned electronic discussion list. And you, the opportunity to sign up for that will be in the evaluation that will pop up at the end of this webinar. But you can also email the email that you see in this uh, slide in front of you to be added. And the idea of this electronic discussion list, list is for you to be able to call out to each other and ask for tips and suggestions and share ideas and stories. Um, 
as well as questions. It is not something where we as ALA will simply be pushing out information. Um, we also want to recommend that you check out the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation Resource Center. They have, uh, as Courtney mentioned, more models, more resources that we have not been able to fit into this project, but hope to fit into future projects. They have a network of people who may well be in your neighborhood and your region that you can connect with to also work on this, um, pursue this work independently and as you go along with your learning. And I want to, again, urge you all to register now for the first series. Registration for the first series of webinars is open at ala.org, LTC Models. And I think we are at a point where we can look at questions. So I am going to Try to get back to my chat window. <laughs> uh, Mary, did you want me to read you some of the questions? Yes, and I'm going to ask Samantha from uh, the public, progr P public programs office to um, pose some of the questions, and uh, I want you all to feel free to chime in with your take on them in the chat box as well. Thanks, Samantha. No problem. So one that I've seen uh, from quite a few people is is there any chance that the workshop sessions will be duplicated or virtualized? So this is Mary. I will try to answer that. Um, is there a chance? Yes. It is our ardent hope. Uh, this is a grant-funded initiative. We are looking for additional resources so that we can distribute these resources, uh, additional financial resources, <laughs> Uh, to distribute um, all of this as widely as possible. Um, so we, the answer is we are working on it. However, understand that the webinar series has been designed as self-contained learning sessions, and the pre-conferences or workshops that are in person are a way to get together with others in person and try out one of the models that you will be learning in a webinar series. So. Yes, ideally I'd love everyone to be able to be in person, um, but y you will still be learning the model um, on the webinar. I hope that answered that. Great. Uh, so this one's for Courtney. Uh, what internal conditions must exist for a public library to actually affect community transformation? Well, goodness, that's a big question right there. Um, so in, I guess I'm perhaps the person who asked that question can chime in on the chat with a little bit more of, of what they're looking for. I mean, I think for any of you, there's a question certainly of capacity. Um, so what is the capacity of the library to, um, to both convene a conversation and should the library be a convener, meaning um, are you, you know, who, what kind of conversation are you having and who's responsible for the outcome? If it's something that community members are ultimately responsible and those who participate, it might be fitting for the library to be a, a convener and the, the host of that process. Um, if it's something with other entities that need to be a part of that, you know, the library might be a partner um, or part of that. Um, you may serve as the host space for it, or you might facilitate those conversations. Um, there's lots of possibilities for what you can do. Um, but in terms of conflict transformation, let me see if we had, there's no clarification there. Um, it's really, a lot of it is going to depend on the circumstances, the type of issue, um, what players um, what parties, what stakeholder groups um, are going to be involved, who's going to ultimately make decisions, um, things of that sort that will help determine um, the library's role um, in that process, who needs to be involved in, and how to best proceed. Um, and some of that will be conveyed, of course, in the trainings. Um, and as I mentioned before, NCVD is also committed to helping um, connect libraries to our members uh, in their local areas who can further assist with some of that. 
um, figuring out how best to approach these things. Great. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, Mary, this one's for you, and I've seen different uh, variations of it, so I'll try to summarize it. Um, a lot of people are wondering, they think that their sessions that fit their library is too far away, being in um, the midwinter pre-conference in 2018. They're wondering if they can attend the earlier sessions or if they can be moved up. Right. Um, so we would love to be launching all of these resources yesterday at the same time. However, because this is a grant-funded initiative, we're working as fast as we can. So at the moment, the timeline we have in place is the timeline we have to work with. I would ask you to, as you're looking at the models that Courtney explained a bit and you sort of go through them on the website, um, I would ask you to look at them and select ones that you feel might work best for your situation and what you are trying to tackle and register with that in mind. So while I know that it, and, and feel free, especially for the webinars, to register for all of them if they all seem like they have value. Um, but at this point, the project timeline is um, set due to the sort of our capacity and constraints of our resources. But we will, I promise, get as much out there as quickly as possible. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so I have one for Cindy. Um, who were some of the community partners in your community, if any? Sure. So for um, the conversations and the potlucks, I assume we're talking about. So for the community conversations, in order to um, pull together those 12 conversations that I talked about, we partnered with uh, groups that were super close to us. So for example, I am a local Rotary member in Columbus. So the very first conversation that we did was with my Rotary group. So we started with one that was really easy to arrange where they had no choice but to say yes to me who was already a member of their group. Um, and then we worked from there to the um, more difficult ones and uh, the uh, groups that we didn't necessarily have really close relationships with. So that picture that you saw with the um, business groups in the window, I partnered heavily with one man who was on both of the groups, the chamber and the um, downtown group, and he helped pull them together. So uh, we partnered with groups that could do the heavy lifting for us and bring the people to the table for those, those uh, conversations. For the potlucks, um, we had kind of a three C's uh, driving us. Our C's were to convene, and you've heard that word a lot, and to connect and to communicate. So you're really asking about the connect. So uh, once we heard what the small group projects were going to be, the library's role in getting those projects done was simply to connect people to the resources that they needed to accomplish their tasks. So in some cases, that meant connecting them with community partners. So for example, one of the big projects um, that's happened multiple times now is a park cleanup. The, the Route for Columbus people have kind of adopted a, a park. And uh, we have to partner very heavily with the Department of Public Works to be able to do that. We truly couldn't do it without them, but the library can leverage its relationship to do that. And we've done the same thing with lots of um, events, partnering with organizations that are throwing them um, anyway. We just kind of jump right in and say, hey, uh, Root for Columbus wants to have something to do with this too. I could list the myriad organizations we work with, uh, but oh, I will say we have one core group of five community organizations and we meet monthly at this point and do joint events together and co-market each other's events. And that is us at the library, um, the Columbus Recreation, Columbus Senior Center, the Columbus Public Schools, and the Columbus Community Hospital. So we've become a really tight-knit group in large part uh, because of this work. Great, thanks, Cindy. So this one's for Mary again. Yep. Uh, so for conference, is there a maximum number of participants from one library that can come to it? Uh, for the in-person workshop, no, we have not yeah. set a maximum. Uh, we have not set a maximum. Um, yeah, there is no maximum. Okay, great. And um, I see some questions about when registration opens for the pre-conference at ALA. Pre, I'll answer that one. Uh, pre-conference registration is already open. 
um, you can visit ALA's conference site, and I will post a link to that in a few minutes in the chat box to register. Um, another question is maybe for either you or Courtney, Mary. Uh, we, some people are interested in working jointly as a public library and an academic library together for community engagement. What theories would they fit into? Well, I'll answer this first just from my perspective. Uh, this is Mary. Um, again, what I would do is look at the models and think about um, what you, you know, what you're trying to tackle. Um, what issue you're trying to tackle, what type of group you're trying to pull together. I think that the, um, the framework that um, Courtney shared from NCDD, the engagement streams are, can be quite helpful with this. Um, exploration, conflict transformation, transformation, decision making, or collaborative action, to think about that and go back. Again, I also think that you can perhaps arrive at some of that knowledge by, um, you know, participating in um, both types of webinars and, you know, learning a little bit more about those models that way. Those are my thoughts, but Courtney, you, you certainly will have more. Yeah, I am resending the engagement streams framework into the chat right now um, for folks to take a look at. That I highly recommend as something to um, to take a closer look at. Um, as you'll see, it really breaks down um, not just the primary intention or purpose of these different streams, which is what I focused on um, earlier on in our presentation, but it also talks about types of issues that are ripe for, for these types of processes, when it might be most important to use. Um, different strategies and, and questions to answer. So it's, it's a really in-depth um, resource for you to examine what might be um, best for you to use. Um, I think partnering across libraries can be very helpful and powerful, and so I encourage that. And But again, I think some thought and planning about what might be, um, what you might want to do and, and what methods might help you um, best in doing that um, would be very helpful as you um, decide how to proceed. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention, because um, there are different questions about um, about the trainings and um, you know how much folks will learn in the webinars versus the in-persons, and we know that the in-person trainings are, are more selective. Um, several, if not many, of the processes that we're featuring here are, um, are pretty um, easy to pick up and have additional resources available to you so that post-webinar, with the resources that are available, you should feel pretty confident um, to be able to bring them to your community. Um, Conversation Cafe, for instance, is such a simple um, and elegantly simple process, as we like to refer to it, um, that anyone can really pick it up with minimal training. We held an um, hour-long um, host training ourselves um, in January for folks uh, just to get them up to speed on this is how it works and here's where the resources are available and you know please go out into your communities and host some conversations and that was that's really all you need to get started um, so several of these these methods that you'll be introduced to you'll see are pretty much um, grab and go um, I know when we spoke to um, Audrey who I featured in my comments earlier about World Cafe um, she talked about um, actually experiencing World Cafe at an ALA um, meeting previously um, and really learning the process and skills there. Uh, and she further developed those skills and adapted them um, so that she could then uh, convene conversations in her community as well. Uh, so I just want to encourage you that um, when I say things like, you know, you're just getting started and all of that. A lot of these processes are pretty um, simple and you are all very savvy people and I think that you'll be able to, to learn a lot in these webinar sessions. Um, and if you need additional assistance, like I said, we're gonna continue to connect you to our members. Um, and we're, of course, we'll, we will continue to be there for you all as a resource. Great, thank you both. 
Uh, so let's knock out a few of the quick logistical questions. Uh, these are for you, Mary. Can volunteers from community agencies take part in the training? And I'm assuming they mean the pre-conference. Um, you know, at this point, the pre-conference will need to be uh, limited to library workers um, simply because we just have limited seats. Um, and I also want to just address the fact that I'm hearing from attendees here in the chat that our pre-conference is showing it sold out, which, believe me, is new <laughs> since the beginning of this, uh, this webinar. So you guys are amazing. Um, and we had already requested that our conference services set up a waiting list for that. Um, I'm discerning that since you've told me it's sold out, that waiting list is not yet in place. So what I will ask you to do is email. Um, is Samantha, you can weigh in here on who they should email so that we can add their name to the waiting list if that is not already in place through conference services. Um, yeah, you can email me. My, I'll post my email really quick. Um, yeah, so you can just email me there, and we will add you to the wait list. Um, another quick question is, should we or can we use the library's transform hashtag for this effort? Yes, please. Please use the library's transform hashtag for this effort. Uh, that is the hashtag we're using, and it is, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, it is what we're using um, for this entire initiative, and we would love it if you tweet uh, with Libraries Transform hashtag. Thank you. Could you explain the Credly badge a little bit more? Sure. The Credly badge is um, simply an effort to recognize um, your learning here, and um, Badging has been something that has been popular, um, especially for uh, digital resumes and professional profiles. So we're offering it as a professional recognition token um, for participating in any of the segments. So you, you earn a badge per online learning session that you participate in, not counting this one, which is an overview. And then after you, for any of the tracks, after you've completed um, the three and um, a more in-depth workshop, we offer a further badge. Um, I hope that is, I hope that is a sufficient explanation. I think so. And then this one is, I think, more for Courtney. Um, what kind of resources will the library need to implement events like these community engagement? So it varies. Um, and, and you'll learn that a bit more uh, as you explore some of these um, methods. Um, it, as I had mentioned, um, some of the processes, Conversation Cafe, for instance, um, requires absolutely minimal resources. You need, you know, space for a small group of people to sit in a circle around each other um, and a topic and the guidelines. Um, and so, you know, for libraries with minimal resources and want to bring people together and really just explore a topic, that's something that can be done, you know, pretty simply um, with a small, you know, short amount of time. Um, if you're looking at more of the decision-making or collaborative action processes or perhaps those uh, conflict transformation processes, so that reflective structured dialogue um, that I talked about, you know, as I, the example I shared was a seven-year process. Now, of course, you're not necessarily talking about that, but um, that requires a little bit more planning. Um, decision-making, certainly, in terms of getting all of the key people to the table uh, can take some time in terms of cr uh, creating the right partnerships to get people involved, um, getting people uh, to participate. Um, a lot of it is about building relationships and inviting folks in. Um, and then there's the aspect of just planning for the dialogue, um, framing the conversation, preparing to facilitate, which you may or may not do depending upon your comfort level and what type of issue you're trying to tackle. Um, so it will vary, but generally speaking, um, some of the exploratory conversations tend to fall more into just the logistical needs in terms of thinking about what resources you need. 
um, to set things up, whereas the collaborative action, decision making, and, and in some cases the conflict transformation sessions um, can require a little more thinking about um, the right people to get involved, partnerships, um, perhaps hosting conversations in multiple locations on the logistical end, and so on, depending on how complex um, an issue you're talking about. Great. Um, thanks, Courtney. So another question is, um, if my library is more in a medium category, and this is one that I see pop up quite a bit, um, do, should I go for the larger urban area or would the smaller mid-sized one fit? Does it depend on my area type or the size more? Again, this is Mary. I think the answer to that is really where you see yourself. Um, so look at the models, think about what you're trying to do, and, um, you know, it, it's really where you see yourself as a practitioner and where you see your community. We trust your instincts, so it's your self-perception. Thanks, Mary. And we have time for one more question. So this one I've seen pop up a couple of times. Um, Courtney, I think this is more towards you. Um, mm -hmm. How do you bring together people from different viewpoints and go beyond the different uh, the same 20 people who usually show up for events? And I know that's a more broader question. Yeah, um, I think what I've found in my own experience um, and, and what I think my colleagues would say is um, a lot of it comes down to um, finding the right way to invite people in. And in some cases that means um, reaching out beyond your usual avenues. Um, if you just put up some flyers or posts on your website that you're having a conversation and all are invited to participate, you're likely to get those usual suspects. Um, if you go out and talk to the community, um, engage with other community organizations um, or other entities and ask them about how to bring people that are part of um, their community in, um, you're more apt to see diversity um, of perspectives and diverse um, folks in the room. Um, so if you're having a conversation about immigration, for instance, um, you want to think about different organizations in the community that serve um, diverse groups, um, folks who work with um, recent immigrants, um, you know, think about those different, those different types of um, organizations. But oftentimes partnering with different organizations to recruit um, and encourage participation amongst the different groups they serve is um, the best way to recruit um, both diverse participation and certainly diverse perspectives. Okay, Great. thanks so much, Courtney. I think that is all the time we have today for questions, but you can continue your questions and comments and all of this uh, by signing up to our electronic discussion list. I want to remind everyone to register now and also to uh, please complete the evaluation at the end of this. And I want to thank uh, Courtney and Cindy um, and thank the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, the Institute for Museum and Library Service, the Public Library Association, and our Models for Change Advisory Group for their guidance. And as well as my colleagues behind the scenes, Stephen, Samantha, Brian, and Colleen, for their support of this webinar and the Library's Transforming Communities Models for Change initiative. The overview webinar has been part of ALA's Library's Transforming Communities initiative, which addresses a critical need within the library field by developing and distributing tools and resources to support the work of engaging communities in innovative ways. Thank you all so much for being with us today and for your excellent questions and your thoughts and your ideas. Have a good afternoon.